So on behalf of NQ Dry Tropics, um, I'd like to welcome you to our second session in our P2R conversation series. Um, the purpose of these conversations is to raise awareness and understanding of the Paddock's Reef Monitoring, Modelling and Reporting Program by presenting locally relevant information on the program and its application in our Burdekin region. Uh, the series kicked off last month with an overview of the Paddock to Reef program by Carl Mitchell from the Department of Environment and Science. A recording of that presentation can be found on the NQ Dry Tropics website, along with a copy of the slides and a four page summary. Uh, similarly, a recording of today's session and a summary and a copy of the slides will also appear on the NQ Dry Tropics website in the very near future. Today's session is intended to cover the Paddock to Reef Management Practice Adoption Program. Um, these answers to the Paddock to Reef questions help to establish progress towards the reef water quality targets and make a significant contribution to the reef water quality report card. Today's presenter is Adam Northey, who's the coordinator of the Paddock to Reef Management Practice Adoption Team in DAF. Adam is going to give us a little history on the development of the questions, what information they're trying to gather, how and when those questions have changed over time, or sorry, how and why they've changed over time and what changes are likely to happen in the future. So a little housekeeping. Um, um, we've made a longer booking to Zoom um, compared to last month, which dropped out a little bit prematurely. So we apologize for that, but we'll make sure that we've got, definitely made sure we've got enough time for the presentation and heaps of time for questions and answers. Um, if you do have a question, we'd really appreciate you if you could either use the raise hand logo or just type your question into the chat. Um, I'll facilitate the conversation to keep it on time and topic. Um, we do ask that all participants be respectful of one another and um, a reminder uh, that um, broader information about the program, the Paddock to Reef program is available through our earlier presentation and also online if you just Google Roof reef plan or go to the reef plan website, you can find out heaps of information. Um, and also just a, a, a clear reminder that the whole discussion is being recorded. Um, it will be published on the website as a, as a, as a recording, um, hopefully in the next day or two. All right, so I'll hand over to Adam and please don't forget questions early. We're happy to interrupt the flow of the conversation to um, raise questions that are relevant at the time, um, but please keep it on topic. Right, I'll hand it over to Adam. Thanks. All right, oh, get my screen up and going. Right, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, so I'm Adam Northey. We're going to have a chat today about the management practice adoption program and the <clears throat> so the paddock to reef questions, how they're used, how they've evolved over time. Because it's it's when you understand how they've evolved over time, it sort of helps helps to frame why we ask questions the way we do and what things we're actually trying to find out. Um, so I've been with DAF for about seven and a half years now in the Management Practice Adoption Program. And before that, I was actually with FBA and I was doing their reef program stuff there as well. So, so I've been in this sort of reef space now for about 10 years. Um, and seeing the evolution and, you know, obviously uh, experienced it from being on ground, asking the questions and then right through to now to where, you know, where we're assessing the questions. So we've been through a few iterations of it. And um, yeah, I'm gonna hopefully help you guys understand where, why they're like they are and, you know, what we're trying to achieve. So <clears throat> the program I'm in, Managed Practice Adoption Team, it's, it's got two main goals about it. So the first one is to monitor the adoption of best practice of improved land management practices and report on the target uh, and report against the land management target. So when I talk about the land management targets, this one in particular, this one here, the, this brown one down at the bottom. So 90% of lands and priority areas under grazing, horticulture, banana, sugarcane, and other broad acre crops are managed using best management practice systems for water quality outcomes or nutrient pesticide. So we have the carriage of reporting against this, this uh, target under reef plan and you know, putting that data into the reef report card. The second major part about what we do is we provide the data to the modeling team so that they can model the impact of these water quality, these um, management land management changes. And that goes into the report card as well. So 
for us, you see our data directly reported against this target in the report card, but also the modeled outcome. So when we say there's been a reduction in, in sediment or DIN or pesticide or whatever kind of thing in the report card, that comes from the data that's come through us. A couple of other things that we, we need to do as well, uh, are providing feedback to the investors. So Queensland, Australian governments and GBRF about the, the effectiveness of their investments. Um, and, you know, we also provide feedback back to the people on the ground, the delivery groups, um, about how to, how to be more effective in the system. So how, how to help, how to use the system to, to promote the work that you're doing well. So I'm going to start here with the land management targets. So we're, we've got that 90% adoption of best practice. Um, that has a lot of impacts about the information we need to collect and, um, you know, it really frames the questions we need to ask. But where did it come from and why does it look like that? So the reef plan or reef water quality protection plan, or it's currently known as the reef uh, water quality improvement plan, has been around since about 2003, I think the first one came out. Um, the first one was really about monitoring and, and getting to know uh, what, the, what the, the critical stress is on the reef and that sort of stuff. Now, in 2009, this document came out, the Reef Water Quality Protection Plan, 2009. This one came out, and this is where we first seen the water quality, uh, the land management targets, and then these water quality targets here over on the, uh, on the right side here. So our very first land management target was this one. 80% of landholders in agricultural enterprises, sugarcane, horticulture, dairy, cotton and grains, have adopted improved soil, nutrient and chemical management practices, okay? So what we were saying here is in the five years between 2009, 2013, this is what we wanted to achieve. So what we needed to do was set up a reporting process around. So because this is just a percentage of landholders, we didn't need to know where they were. We didn't need to know really what they were doing, just that they were getting better. So, you know, if you've engaged with, a, with a, an extension officer or, or somebody like that, you know, it should be about getting better. So this target was really about engagement. We used Australian Bureau of Statistics data to go, okay, in the vertical, there's this many graziers, then we just count. Okay, we've, we've worked with this many graziers, are we at 80% yet? So there's lots of things that were issues in this initial stuff, in this initial target. Um, you know, we, there was lots of attempts to, well, we, what we had to do was make sure that we weren't counting the same landholder twice, but it was really hard to make that that didn't happen. Um, so often we got a lot of double counting, the same landholder would turn up two or three times and we'd count them and they'd be counted two or three times in the 80%. And it was really scattergun approach. So in, in grazing in particular, in, in the Burdekin and the Fitzroy, the, the catchment's right out west. They're such a long way away from the, from the coast that there's just not a huge amount of sediment making it from out there to the back, to the, to the, the um, mouth of the river. So if we're working at the back there, which was happening a lot, the impact of the works we were doing just weren't having much impact on, on the stuff at the mouth of the river. So very scattered, lots of issues. And here's an example of reporting. So this is a sugarcane example, but you could exchange this for grazing. It looks the same. So we got a, you know, a project number. So that each project got a unique ID. Each farmer had to get an ID as well. Industry, in this case, sugar, substitute it for grazing. Project area, a catchment, how much reef rescue money, some in-kind and then a description. So swap this out for land type fencing, fencing off waterways, whatever you want to put a description in there that's relevant to, to, um, to grazing. And that, this is what reporting looked like. So with a target that said engagement, reporting was this. Now, um, when I was with FBA, the, the guys on ground, so you know our extension officers that were out on farms working with farmers, they, 
weren't involved at all in in any of the reporting. This was all we did all of this in the office. So we, you know, we tracked all of this and we put it up into a spreadsheet and we flicked it off to the Australian government, and that was that was our reporting. <clears throat> so once that five year period had finished, so that two thousand nine to two thousand and thirteen a new reef water quality protection plan comes in, came in. So, and the new one here, 2013, so this is a 13 to 17 document. <clears throat> it came in with a, with a much more targeted land management um, target. So much more refined land management target. So the, the water quality targets didn't change a huge amount. There was, you know, some moving around to some of the numbers but they kind of still said the same, but the land management target changed considerably. And what we've seen was we have this 90%. So now we have a defined amount of change that we want to get, okay, of lands. So it's no longer farmers. It's about an area using best, so 90% of sugarcane, horticulture, cropping, grazing lands are managed using best management practice systems. So essentially what the big change here was, we went from a shift to area. So we went from counting the number of landholders we engaged with to now saying we need landholders, we need a certain amount of landholders or actually a certain amount of area managed by landholders to achieve a certain uh, level of management. Okay, so it's a big shift away from area, a uh, big shift to area away from counting landholders and a shift to needing to improve practices and so needing to achieve best practice. So that, that was quite a big thing for us in our program. So we need to know a couple of things. We need to know how, where we are at this 90% adoption. So how far away are we? How close are we kind of thing? Because it's about heating a certain amount. Um, and we also needed to know what we needed to define and get people to tell us about best practice. Okay, so what came out from that as a result of the change target, what needed to come into place was the water quality risk framework. So this is the 20, 2013 version of it, where we start to define what best practice is. And um, in this one here, we haven't actually said best practice, but what we, what is best practice in these is this very low and low risk. So these two classes here were best practice. So if we had, People uh, we had farmers out here that were in these two and they were moving to this, they were contributing to best practice. <clears throat> and we had to then work out how much of the industry or how much of the area, sorry, is managed using best practice. So when we needed to do this for pastures or hill slope erosion process, stream banks and gullies. So, <clears throat> and this data here was actually informed by about 500 one-on-one -on -one surveys done with DAF staff, different consultants, some of the NRM groups might've been involved as well, uh, who went out, spent a few hours with, a, you know, sitting around the table with, a, with different graziers throughout the Fitzroy and the Burdekin, Burnett Mary, like throughout the GBR catchments, asking them, benchmarking, things about their businesses. So, you know, how do you manage stocking rates, all that sort of stuff. So that data there is what informed these targets here. <clears throat> so because that target had changed to area, we needed to bring in spatial reporting. So this is when spatial reporting started. So, you know, you needed needing to have a map of where things were and also the need to report against the water quality risks frameworks using the P2R surveys or the P2R questions. So we started to see the, the farms come in and then the questions. So this is when we, before that, the reporting was just a spreadsheet. Now it becomes a, becomes a shape file with farms in there and the before and after prep questions. So we had to set up the before and after questions around uh, trying to find, you know, so, so the first lot of questions come in about management. 
Now, this is the 2013 questions, and I'd forgotten how bad they were until I pulled them out in the last few days. So you'll see here that we actually ask about, uh, do you have gullies on your property? How are they managed? And then there's another, there's a couple of other questions here about stream banks, which are similar-ish kind of to what we all ask already. But for hill slope erosion, what we actually asked is um, what, what, change in ground cover management have you achieved? And what we were asking for, is it a C to B? Is it a D to C? Is it a B to A change? So what we got was answers to these questions before and after. And then another one up the top here, which was like C to B. So that was the reporting back in 2013. So you can kind of see like we had, um, particularly if we're talking about uh, hill slope erosion processes. We're just asking um, you guys or whoever to go, well, what sort of practice change was it? Is it, oh, to see, well, what sort of ground cover management changes have been? Oh, to see to be. Um, you guys were having to make assessments against the risk frameworks and go, oh, you know, if I do these sorts of practices, that's a C to B. So it was quite uh, immature the process and um, you know lots and lots of assumptions were made about it so we're saying oh you know if you say you're moving c to b then we've got a that's this much less erosion and that sort of stuff so lots and lots and lots of assumptions made with with these original set of questions okay so the that period winds up the 2017 period so that five-year period and then we roll into the next reef plan or reef and this time reef water quality improvement plan so 17 to 22 so it's it's winding up now and i'll go through that in a, a little bit later the target was refined a little bit in that it was it, it you'll see like the target basically stayed the same except that we've added in this a sentence down the bottom here for water quality outcomes so it's still 90 percent of lands in priority areas under grazing, horticulture, banana, sugarcane, and other broad acre cropping are managed using best management practice systems for water quality outcomes. Okay, so the priority areas refers to what we have, what we now have is um, in the previous targets, it would be like a 20% reduction in sediment in the GBR. Whereas now what, hap what, what came in in 2017 was catchment specific targets so you know we now have fine sediment in the Burdekin river the target is a 30 percent reduction which equates 840 kilotons is what the reduction is aiming for okay and the dawn it's 55 and which is 30 percent so it's now now becomes more targeted so you know we're saying areas that we really want to focus on are these red areas so you know the Burdekin comes up as red for sediment and um Herbert comes up as a as a uh, high, so very high for the Burdekin for sediment and a high for the Herbert. But when you look down in Mackay, so, you know, Pioneer is a low risk, so it becomes green. So it's about trying to focus, again, going from a big scattergun approach, the whole reef, to where are the really, where are the places we need to focus more and more effort on? <clears throat> A little bit of refinement of the risk frameworks. There weren't some huge, there weren't a massive changes in here. So a little bit of uh, the way it was laid out was changed. Um, some numbers came in here, um, but not a huge amount of change in the frameworks. The benchmarks, it was also a chance to update our benchmarks. Now, <clears throat> we, in the original benchmarks, we had a lot of, um, we, we had some confidence issues in them in that they're based on only, you know, like I said, 500 uh, surveys across the 5,000 graziers in the, in the GBR. Um, so not massively representative. So what we tried to do back here was move to a more spatially... Um, we we'll use remote sensing more to try and inform us about where, about how the landscape's managed. So what we attempted to do was use a spatial model to map land condition across the GBR. 
So our, our view on this is that land condition is a consequence of management. So uh, high risk, risky management, you know, running country hard results in a drop down of land condition, looking after country well means that land condition lift, lifts up. So what we're trying to do is say, okay, if, if a country, if country's in good condition, then it's had good management. If country it's had good management in the long term, if country's in bad condition, it's had poorer management in the long term. Uh, that didn't, we didn't get the confidence in that product as much as we would have liked. So the benchmarks weren't updated. We didn't have the data to really update the, the benchmarks here. So we've carried through the changes, but they're still based on that original set of data. The questions had a change um, and now more towards the stuff that you guys are familiar with now. So, and the big change here is about, um, we refined much more. So we started to, we, we wanted to know, we, what we were trying to find out is how much grass, so through the, the questions and what we wanted to know through the risk framework is basically how much grass is being left in the paddock at the end of the dry season. So the start of the wet season, how much grass is on the ground there to protect you know, hold the soil together and all that sort of stuff when the rains, when the first storms start to happen. So we sort of went through a process. We're going, well, do we ask questions about uh, long-term carrying capacity and adjusting stocking rates? So trying to be more proxy sort of questions. So if you're doing these, um, you know, if you're adjusting your stocking rates and well and using grazing charts or forage budgets or something like that, um, you know, that should mean that you have a better handle on how much grass you have. So should be able to manage, have stuff on the ground at the end of the year was what we were trying to attempt with, you know, question two and three. Question one really, um, be, it becomes apparent to us and, and we, one of the evolutions we'll go through into the future is that just, just asking works really well. So just trying to work out, you know, what is the utilisation? So if there's a certain amount of pasture in the paddock, how much is being eaten? Because that tells us how much is left on the ground at the end of the day. So question one became more, much more, uh, you know, about collecting some real actual data about, about and that, if, that we can sort of point much more at, less assumptions and say, well, you know, this is how much grass we believe is on the ground at the end of the season. Okay, so we've got this reporting reporting framework now built up around, you know, giving us some areas and um, giving us a before and after suite of questions, um, before and after survey. So why is all of that? Why do we do all of that? So what we're trying, what we're current, what we're trying to do is go, okay, what are the current practices on a particular area? So how is this area currently managed? So we use that stuff. That tells us firstly about management and that sort of stuff. But that also goes over to the modeling team and they use that information to say, well, if that area is managed using those particular practices, then the losses should be about this. Okay. And then with the after questions, what we're doing is going, okay, what are the new practices? So how are the, how are the practices on this farm changed? Because that then gets you used to say, well, if the practices have changed from whatever they were before to this, the new losses off that place are X. Now, when we, when we look at the two, the before practices and before last losses and the after practices and the after losses, the difference between the two is the change. And what we're really interested in here is the change. Okay, so... Um, yeah, the, the whole thing is about the change because the what we want to do is is you know get as much change as we possibly can. So, <clears throat> so what we'll do is we'll just follow through a bit of an example of how how it kind of works. So, question one here, somebody's put uh, we've put this in. We said we're growing this amount. We have this many uh, animals in there for the for the dry season, and they were great. So before we, we've 
we've kept the total biomass bio, bio the same. Uh, so two and a half thousand before and after. We said we had 50 head in there. We're going to change that down to 30 after. We said they were in there for 150 days. We're going to keep it. We're going to change that down to 100 days as well. So what's that used for? So what we're trying to do here is get an estimation of the percentage of grass eaten. So the utilisation rate in there, because the more that's eaten, the less that's available, less is available sitting there for to hold the grass, to hold the ground, the soil together when it starts raining. So, you know, the first thing we do here is we go, okay, well, how much grass is eaten by the cattle? So we run through this equation when we say we've got 50 AEs, their feed demand is about eight kilos per day. They're in there for 150 days. So oh, this has moved around. <clears throat> so their feed demand is 60,000 kilos, okay, in this 40 hectare paddock. Oh, this, sorry, their, their feed demand is 60,000 kilos. For those 50 head for 150 days, they need about 60,000 kilos. We now go through and work out, well, how much grass is in this paddock? So we said up here, we said we had two and a half thousand hectares, uh, two and a half thousand kilos per hectare. This paddock here is 39 hectares. So we had this paddock is has grown 97,500 kilos. So when we work at that out as how much is eaten, 62% of what was produced is eaten here. Okay. So then because we've changed the number of head and for the days in there, we run through this again. So we have those 30 head eating for eating roughly eight kilos a day for hundred days. Their feed demand is 24,000 kilos now. Okay, so they went from 60 down to 24,000. We've got rid of 20 and we've, we've reduced the amount of time they're in there by 50 days. So when we go through the same amount of grass, so it's still the two and a half thousand kilos per hectare by 39 hectares, equals that 97 and a half thousand. So now we work out the ratio. So we've got, and we're going, okay, now they're only, they're now only 25% of the pasture has been eaten out of that paddock the, and the remainder is left there. So this is what we're trying to do with this utilization rate question. <clears throat> so we've gone through there, we've got two utilization rates, okay? 62 and a 25. We then look at these questions here around carrying capacity, stocking rate management, and each one of these gets a score. Okay, so if they going, I don't consider carrying capacity as the before, they would get a, you know, as a, I don't consider carrying capacity, you get a zero score. If it moves down to, you know, carrying capacity using property maps, we get a 10. Uh, same thing here. How do you manage stocking rates? I don't adjust them, you know, I use forage budgets. So we go through, if we look through the, the before, so we started with a utilization rate of 62. We've got this, these bands here around, which give us a score for the different utilization rates. So we would have at 62, we're over this 31. So there would have been, we would have got a zero for utilization rate. Uh, so we got a zero here for carrying capacity and I don't know, maybe a 10 for stocking rate adjustments. We then get this. So what we then have for hill slope, and this is the same for stream banks as well, is that we have these uh, we have these bands that we put we need to put people in to align with the the modelling and the and the reporting, um, and each one of these bands has a range of scores. So we'd gone through we had our practices before we got uh, for the utilisation rate and the way they manage um, long term carrying capacity and stocking rate. We end up with a before score of 22.5. So that's going to put us over here in this D range. And then we've done some changes. Okay, so it might it was that we reduced the number and the length that they're in that area. So we now get this score of 60. So we've gone from this uh, D, and I think I can't remember which way I went. Yes, yeah, so we jumped up to this C area here. So we've gone a hill slope D to C. So that's that's how we're measuring that practice change. Now, when we say practice change, what we what we need to what we talk about currently is the move between these bands. Okay, so 
a practice change here is going to need to jump from a D to a C or a C to a B. Now, you'll see in particular C, so for all scores from 26 to 60 fit in the C category. Now, there can be a change on a paddock which moves them in between this, now it, but it doesn't count as a practice change in the current system if they sit, if they move in there. They need to have moved out of this band and into the next band to become a C, become a practice change. And then to contribute to the, uh, to the target around 90% of adoption of best practice, they need to have then moved or had moved into this A and B. So you need to have gone out of this C and B, SCD, sorry, into the AB. So for the projects that were going D to C, they weren't contributing to the, well, they don't contribute, or they didn't contribute to the 90% adoption of best practice target. They still get modelled. So that the impact on uh, sediment reduction is still still modelled here. So we'd still be saying, yes, there was this change, but uh, they didn't contribute to the 90% adoption target. Okay. Right, so how do we then take that information and estimate a sediment saving? So we use uh, the, the, the hill slope modeling uh, the, the hill slope reductions are estimated through a model called, I think, I, can I make that go up? Oops. Through a model called the revised universal soil loss equation, which is just, on well, my screen's hidden behind my bar here. So what it is, it's a grid-based approach, and this is run across all of the grazing lands in the whole of the GBR. So what we do is we overlay rainfall erosivity. So this is, this is real rainfall, from bomb weather stations, uh, you, you actually can download a gridded layer which tells you, um, you know, how much rainfall fell and what's the intensity and how many days and that sort of stuff. A soil erodibility layer. So, you know, soil types, different soil types are more stable than others. So you have a soil erodibility ability, um, layer in there. We have a slope steepness and a slope length. So for slope steepness, um, you know, area with more, more um, a steeper area is obviously going to have faster running water across it. And length is important too, because if you've got a big long length, it has a, the water has more opportunity to get, to build energy up as it's running along there. And the more energy it has as it's running across the surface means the more erosive force it has. Now, the next layer down is cover. So in this case here, this is satellite drive cover. So it goes through a correction factor to correct the difference between um, observed and satellite cover, but it's satellite drive cover. Um, and this is the actual cover that, that was on a block of ground for uh, the years 2000, uh, no, sorry, 19, 86, I think, through to, through to 2014. So the, all the cover periods for that whole area. Now, there is a layer in here called practice. Now, that, this is generally set to one in here. So the universal soil loss equation was built, uh, was first set up around the, um, around cropping in uh, the United States in the 1930s, I think. So this practice layer is generally used to be able to say, well, I've gone from tillage to zero till, so I can, I can use that to influence this equation around the roughness and stuff like that of the land. So, but in a grazing instance, we generally keep it, keep it at zero or keep it at one, I think it is. So when you put all of these together, you end up with an annual average soil loss for each of these for in tons expressed as tons per hectare per, per year. And this here says annual average. What it actually gives you is it gives you in the model, it actually gives you soil loss at each quarter because the, the cover layer is at each quarter. So you can say, okay, over this quarter, the cover was whatever. And it tells you, okay, in, in these periods where uh, the cover was low but rainfall was high, um, you, you had increased soil loss um, in these other periods here where, you know, cover was high, 
um, you know, soil loss was less. So it sort of moves up and down over time. <clears throat> okay, so when we use that there, we can observe the cover. Um, you know, the, the, the cover that's there is the cover that's there. So this gives us a starting uh, sediment loss. So using that there, we can say, okay, we're losing this amount of sediment from each of these grids in here, okay? But that doesn't give us a change. So we know how much, we, we have an estimation of how much we're saving. What we need to do is go, how do we improve this? Now, most of these things here are pretty fixed. You know, we, there's not much we can do as, you know, as graziers or extension officers or whatever to change rainforest, rainfall erosivity, which is, you know, the amount and the, uh, the amount per hour that rain falls. There's not much we can do about that. Soil erodibility, again, there's not a huge amount we can do about that. Um, you know, some soils are more erosive than others. Not much we can do about that. Steepness, again, not a huge amount. Slope length is, um, it, you can work on slope length. Uh, this is where contour banks in cropping land, that's about reducing the slope length. But generally, we're not doing those sorts of things in, in broad scale. Uh, grazing projects, what we're generally trying to do is put things in place that are influencing the cover. So we're wanting to, you know, go from, uh, you know, we're wanting to increase the amount of cover at the end of the season. So what we need to do, so this is a typical ground cover chart. So everybody should, would be familiar with this. I think I pulled this out of, um, out of a forage report. <clears throat> Um, you know, cover moves along throughout the year. What we need to do is work out how to increase the cover in this, okay? So the thing that we, we want to do is push this cover up. We need to work out how to do that in the model. So what, um, what the likes of Mark Silburn did and Giselle Wish and a few other people did was they used data from some of the like the long-term trials. So we're talking about Wombiana, uh, Virginia Park, um, you know, Brigalow, Brigalow catchment study, where we have good long-term data that says if you manage, um, you know, a particular piece of dirt and, um, you know, examples like Wombiana and Brigalow are really great for this because you have, you have a particular area, it's all pretty uniform between them and it, you have all of these different managements. So we have some really heavy grazing, some light grazing, all that sort of stuff. So because we have that great data, we're able to observe the impact on cover on those. So you use that data to then, <clears throat> um, then program the model and be able to say, okay, well, we need to program this model and make this model match what we've seen on the ground. So if you... High utilization rates in this area, you see this sort of cover response. So <clears throat> what they did with, with the, uh, the grass runs was they said, okay, well, now we're able to match what was here. Let's predict the impact of the different different rates of um, different rates of utilization on other areas. So they then modeled pretty much the whole of Queensland and said, okay, we've got all of these other areas. So we expect that we would see similar, similar impacts on utilization on this land type here as what we've seen at Wombiana or this land type here as what we've seen at Brigalow or that sort of stuff. So they went through and, remod and modeled everything and then produced an equation that says, if you change your utilization rate from X to Y, your cover response will be, um, you know, this. So what happens is we take the, the actual observed cover, we add some factors out into it, we, we apply the equation to it, which bumps the cover up by a set amount. Now, well, not by a set amount, by a variable amount. Because what we also know is that, you know, there's periods here, like, so for this, uh, you know, 11, 12 period here where we had lots of rain, so we had lots of cover. If we said it's just a generic bump it up by 10%, at this period here, we're going to end up with 105% cover, which we know is not possible. So it 
it varies the amount of cover response through time. So what it actually does is in these low cover times, it increases it quite a lot. And in these high cover times, just a little bit. So, and then we rerun the universal soil loss equation um, again with the new cover. So if we go back to this, if we've changed this cover here, we get a different annual average soil loss. So, and that's the difference between the two is the saving. Okay, so we're going, whatever the current cover was is, is the consequence of the management that's there. When we bump this cover up, we get a new, we get a, a reduced annual, uh, soil loss and the difference between the two is the saving. Go through that. Okay, so <clears throat> the thing with the universal soil loss equation is it, it estimates the total amount of sediment that will move. So it, it just, it's a big block. Anything that, that will move, it estimates. So the thing that we know is that not all sediment that erodes goes all the way to the reef. Okay, so, you know, this is a, an example. We have sediment obviously washing out of this cutter, cutting here. A lot of it's moved, what, two metres kind of thing. You can see the lighter brown stuff here, the fine sediments, they've gone a lot further. They're going. But these bigger, coarser sediments have only moved a couple of metres. So we have to apply a couple of delivery ratios. So the first one we apply is, is this one that's paddock to stream, okay? And it's about saying not everything that can erode makes it to the stream. We have deposition between the, the site of erosion and the stream itself. Okay, so in uh, in the likes of projector, that is a that's ten percent. It it is it is variable in the modelling. Uh, so the models will have it. You know, in the higher rainfall areas, it's bumped up a bit. In the lower rainfall areas, it's bumped down a little bit. So it is it is a bit variable in the models themselves. Um, the next thing that we have in there in terms of delivery ratios is that. Not all of the sediments which make it to the stream make it to the end of the system. So we know, you know, big impoundments like this, we know that there that there's deposition happening right up in the end there. Like you only have to go when they're into these when the um, you know, when the water levels down a little bit, you can see these big uh, flumes of, of sediment at the beginning of them. Um, you know, some of these are sealing out, not so much in the reef catchments, but um as concerned in other areas about them silting up. So we know that, you know, things like this influence on influence the amount of sediment coming through. We also know distance is a massive thing. So, you know, a, a, a particle of sediment that comes into the river four or 500 kilometres from the mouth has so many more opportunities to settle out, to be caught in behind, you know, a bit of grass on the bank, to end up in a on a floodplain or a wetland or something like that, you have so many more opportunities to fall out. So delivery ratios uh, from the stream to the mouth of the river, which we call the RSDR, Riverine Delivery Ratio, RS, Riverine Delivery Stream Ratio or something like that, is variable throughout the whole catchment. Um, and you'll see here an example, there's all of these little subcatchments throughout all of the throughout the modeling and these we call them either functional units or source catchments depending on who you want to talk to and each one of these has a has a figure for it so and you'll see here uh this is actually in the fitzroy but you'll see here on the on the right hand side so the eastern side of this image all the numbers are larger so 0.4s 0.5s on the left hand side or the western side of the catchment, they're smaller, 0 0.18, 0 0.7s, that sort of stuff, 0 0.6s, 0 0.16s. <clears throat> so this is really, um, really important, particularly in grazing influences, the amount of savings that, that are possible at the end of the system. So remember, this is all about the end of the system. This is one of the major drivers, like the difference between doing a project out here where you've got a point we have only 14% of the sediment making it to the stream is delivered compared to over here where 50% of the sediment is delivered. This is quite a lot. Like the, the cost effectiveness of those two projects is, 
is considerably different. Adam, yep. if I could just refer to the chat, um, there's a couple of questions come in. Bernie's asked whether oh, yeah. the um, K factor, the soil erodibility, includes topsoil and subsoil. Uh, I actually don't know. I can find that out about the K factor in the in the modelling. Um, given that it's RSDR, I would given that it's um, Sorry, universal soil loss equation is really about topsoil. I would think as a guess it's topsoil, but I'll double check and I'll find out. Okay, cool. We can send that out. Once we get that response, we can include that in our um, summary. Um, yep. And there's a couple of questions there that all relate similarly to the, the score ranges for the ABCD um, um, condition or risk. Um, and, Bernie noted that the range for C is quite broad at 25 to 60. Um, and I guess she's asking, you know, what's the reasoning for that? Yeah, so, so what we did to, to set those ranges up was we went through a process where we said, well, if we do particular practice, like what, what type of practices do we think people should be doing to be classified as a B? Okay, so, um, and back when we did this, like the agreements were, well, you should be considering your long-term carrying capacity and you should be doing some sort of forage budgeting and matching, you know, and, and trying to match your stocking rates to your carrying capacity and you shouldn't be utilising more than uh, whatever it was, 25 or 30% or something like that. So when we go through and we look at those, we end up with a score. And then we say, okay, then, what would we consider to be an A? And we end up with another score. And then we go, okay, well, what would we consider to be a C and a D? So it just so happened, like the, 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 the reason that C is so wide is that we went, well, B is here and B came in at 60 and D came in at like 24 or something like that. We said, well, the difference between those two has got to be the C. And that's why we ended up with quite a wide, wide band there for C. So B was set quite, quite high up and D was set quite low. And it just ended up that that was the reason that there's such a wide band in there. Okay. okay. So, um, and then um, Josh is sort of similarly again, um, Noting that there's some, you know, some of those ranges are quite broad. I guess he was, he's um, yeah, asking how do whether, we... a similar, whether there's a similar potential um, with A and B partials like you've got in the sugar framework, whether something like that is possible or feasible. Yeah, this is certainly something that we're, we're really working on and um, we're, we're sitting down with the modelers at the moment. The... the so in, in sugarcane, we've got, we've got a few extra bands, but we're also running through a process where we can do some interpolation between the bands. Um, so we're able to say, if you are, if you are C current, well, if you, are, if you are moving from a C to a, towards a B, but you're only getting 75% of the way, you should get 75% of the benefit. So that's, that's something we're implementing in the sugarcane. It's kind of not, we just don't have the, the, the modeling data, I guess, to be able to do that in grazing at the moment. So there's a lot of talk of like, well, let's let's relook at it this and let's, because you know, it's been one of the criticisms we've had of the model as well, in that we've got essentially six levers to pull. So, you know, uh, D to A, D to B, D to C, et cetera, that sort of stuff. So we don't have many things that we can change in the grazing model to actually get a sediment outcome. So we've we're pushing the, the modelers to, to look at that. And um, we've got a meeting in the next couple of days, I think about it, about re-looking at it and seeing whether we can do it. But we, we are really keen to, to try and get, um, yeah, to try and get that a little bit more refined and a bit more granularity into it. It's far too coarse at the moment. Uh, a lot of what else do we have here? A lot of not yielding, yeah, yeah, and similar to the next part about a lot of small changes, yeah, absolutely. Like the bands that 
having A, B, C, D is, is not good for this. Um, we really need to be able to change it a little bit more. Um, and it probably flows into what I was going to say in this. I'll just read this next question, make sure it's been given some of the broad scoring. So, uh, yeah, so I'll answer those last two questions there in what in this next part here. So this current water quality improvement plan, oops, get a button to work. Its time is up, okay? So it was 17 to 22, so its time is up. Now, so it's due for review. So last year, the there was a commitment to, well, we were always going to review all of the targets in the water quality improvement plan this year. Now, the MPA targets, so that 90% adoption of best practice, that target there, the review of that came has come forward, came forward. So it started the midway through 21, um, and it's just in the process now to wind up in the next six to eight weeks or something like that. <laughs> um, Alluvium with the Alluvium consultancy with the group that that were chosen, they won the tender to to do this work, and I believe they've just finished a round of of consultation through all the regions, probably about a month ago now. And in the process of, you know, going through the work that uh, going through all the comments and that sort of stuff and, um, you know, compiling it together, proposing some new targets um, and, and that sort of thing. So now that with the, this process is going through independent of us, so we're sort of on the edge of it and, um, you know, helping advise Alluvium about potential targets. So, you know, they go, oh, maybe we should have a target about this. And we go, well, it's not something we can really measure or report against. So, you know, it'd be better if it looked like that sort of thing. Um, Alluvium do run a page here that you can get some updates on that. Uh, I believe it should be happening. But <clears throat> the thing is, is that this target here, so this 90% adoption of best management practice systems has set up the risk framework the way it is and really has set up that ABCD and the broad range and the inability to capture little incremental changes and that sort of stuff. So it's, it's gone, it will be replaced with something else. These things here, they were set up about, well, what is best practice? Again, they're gone. They'll be replaced with something else. So we sort of have an opportunity now where we're at in this process, we've got this opportunity to update everything. So the thing that we've, we, we know now and we have access to, which we never used to have, is we know that the outcome is so much more important than the process. So in the early days, it was like you had to be doing forage budgeting to, to be considered best practice. You know, we know that it, it's just, we know that, there's people out there that are doing forage budgeting and, you know, doing everything right, they're cutting grass or grazing charts or whatever they're doing, having great results. There's also people out there that are having really bad results. There's people out there that are doing none of it and having great results. They're just, you know, quite conservative. So in terms of lots of cover all the time sort of thing. So, so the process is not all that important to the outcome. Um, in like the, out the thing that is most important is how much grass is there at the end of the season. That's the really the biggest thing. So we've, we've had a real big move away from asking things about process and putting people into A, B, C, D and all of this sort of stuff and really moving more towards about asking much, much more pointed questions. How much art grass is eaten? How much is left? You know, I don't know, what's the composition of the grass? Um, you know, things like that. So what we'll see is more and more move towards, towards much more pointed stuff around collection, actual data. So making many, many less assumptions. Now, I'd love it if we could, you know, start to model, you know, rather than have an ABCD range. So basically what we've had to do is construct out of the, let's say, you know, utilization rate if we just do it into a percentage there's a 
and we we stay in whole numbers. There's there's a hundred possibilities, right? So we've squeezed that down into four. There's, you know, it's probably unrealistic to be able to measure a hundred of them. Like that's just not something that we can readily do. But we should be able to do many more of those. So we can do rather than four, we could do eight, 10, 20 kind of things. So if we can, through this process, this this chance right now we have this start, this end of the old water quality improvement plan and the start of the new one, this is the chance we're going to get about, this is the chance we have to improve the way that we, we measure change. So I don't see us in the future talking ever again about ABCD. Um, unless we're going to talk about, you know, GLM land condition or something. But in terms of practices, I see is going well away from that. Um, I see we're much more interested about the amount of grass left on the ground at the end of the season, residual cover or utilisation rate or something like that will be, the, be much more the direction we'll go. Um, and if we can go down there, then that probably means that what we can use to inform the model or we'd love to do, and it's just down to having the modelers be able to do it, is just give them actual rates. You know, well, well this one here had a utilization rate of, of you know, whatever, 45, and now it is, now it's 32. Let's let's just model the impact of those two. So they're, they're sort of the directions we'd love to be taking it. Um, we're still, you know, we're still in this review phase now and looking at all sorts of things. We're going to be guided a little bit by whatever the target is. So if the target is about residual cover, then yep, we that's with something we've set up there. But if the target ends up being about something that's a little bit different, then you know, then we change, uh, you know, the things we need to ask of the projects becomes a little bit different as well. Now that is what I wanted to cover in here and really the rest of it is about more questions, um, you know, dive deep into things if people wanted to do that. <clears throat> Thanks, Adam. Um, there's no other questions in the chat at the moment. Um, internally, we did prepare, or NQ Dry Tropics did prepare a couple of questions. Um, Yeah, I thought I had them here. Um, so there is one here, which you haven't really got into specifically because you haven't got done a deep dive into the projector tool. Um, but one of the questions uh, relates to riparian fencing projects um, where, where cattle are being either excluded or you know, reduced grazing pressure on riparian areas through fencing and off-stream water points. Um, as you know, um, with the projector, there's only a significant sediment outcome modelled when the um, stream order is quite high. So a lot of the lower order streams, that we're not seeing a very significant, if any, sediment outcome. And we would have thought there probably is in real life. Um, but uh, I guess some comment on that perhaps and some thoughts on where that, where that might go in the future. Yeah, so I had a bit of bit more of a look into this. Um, so Projector actually doesn't know the stream order. Uh, what what is in Projector is for each of those um, each of those source catchments, there is a a tons per kilometer number in there. So this one over here might be, you know, five tonnes per kilometre losses. That one over there might be seven. This one might be one kind of thing. So there is in projector a stream width sort of thing. And basically, so the way the model works is that in, the, in each source catchment, it, it only has one channel. So it has, a, it has a node that inputs sediment comes from downstream. It generates sediment inside it. And then it exports sediment out of out of the bottom of the of the subcatchment. It it doesn't really know what streams are in there, so it it has one main channel. And that's the one that's generating sediment from. So what we did with the stream width question in there is say, okay, well, we know that we've got a, a main channel, and it's probably going to be the dominant source, but we have these little 
you know, lower order streams coming off the side as well. Now, yes, they are definitely going to be generating sediment, but they're probably not generating at the same rate as the main one. So that's why we had the smaller and the larger in there. So we can wind the rate up and down. Now, I think what's happening with, with these uh, lower order streams that aren't being picked up, I'd say they're in catchments that are, for starters, had low amounts of, of stream bank generation. Um, so if I, I think off the top of my head that the stream bank sediment number for the whole of the verticans only like it's less than 30 percent isn't it i can't just i can't remember the the number of my head it's not it's not a significant amount in the fitzroy totally different and the mary really different but in the verdican from memory your sediment source is dominated by gullies and then hill slope and then i think stream bank comes in at the end so you don't have a huge amount of stream bank sediment to start with um, so you have you have some catchments which have low stream power in them on the main channel, and then if you go a small stream off that, so there probably is sediment there. The thing is, is that it, the rounding is not giving us two significant figures there. Um, we are looking at trying to because there is some you know slight anomalies in there. There is some zeros in the data cube, which we want to kind of wound them up. So what we're sort of looking at doing is trimming the 95th and the and the fifth percentile from the range. So meaning you've got a whole heap of, you've got all these catchments and this one's seven and that one's 10 and that one's five and that sort of stuff. Everything that falls in the 95th percentile, so the top 5%, we'll say, right, oh, well, they're probably too much. So we'll trim them down and anything that falls in the, the bottom, so the zeros, they're, they're not enough, so we'll bump them up. So we'll, hopefully that'll fix up some of those issues, but I'd say it's just, I'm gonna say it's mostly about, about just the location of that particular catchment. It must have, must have low stream power in it. And then when you say it's a small order stream, it only takes 10% of that number. So if we say the, the main channel was, was uh, 10 tons per kilometer, these side ones is one ton per kilometer. But if that main channel is one ton per kilometer, this side one then becomes, you know, much less. And when then, then you take, you say we're saving 25% of that, it starts getting lost in the roundings. All right, thanks. <laughs> um, there was another question here, I'm just gonna find it again. Um, oh, so, Sometimes some newer field officers will often um, voice a bit of confusion about what to do when, um, you know, a practice change doesn't necessarily perfectly fit uh, one of the responses, one of the questions. So obviously the question is going to change noting that, but as a rule of thumb, does your team have a preference on whether we round up or round down a response to a question? I think, I think the most important thing is getting the, the change right. Okay, so the starting and ending point is is less important than the change. So if you round up and it deletes the change, then round down. Or if you round round down and it doubles the change, then round up. If that makes sense. So you know, if the change is a certain amount, then then you know it's it, the change is the important thing. It's it's about representing the change. The start and end point is is important, but not as important as making sure we get the change right in there. So if you have to round. Sometimes you'll have to round up because you know if you round down, the change disappears. And sometimes if you round up, you double the change, which isn't right either. So try and keep the change. Hopefully that that doesn't make it more confusing than it already is. <laughs> Can I just say something with that, Adam? Yeah, yep. So, um, and sometimes the questions or the descriptions don't exactly match the practice, but you try and choose the ones that would match it as best you can before and after, just making sure that that change is what you're getting. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, the, the questions, 
uh, uh, were designed to try and be everything for everybody. So because they got to be everything for everybody, they're very smeared and generic kind of thing. So, you know, then they're going to match some perfectly. Some you've got to kind of look at them a bit sideways to try and get them to match. So you just try and do, I guess, you know, think about the intent of the question as well. Like if this question's saying they're doing, you know, X, Y, Z, the intent is that, you know, um, I don't know, you, you are adjusting stocking rates, whether you're using software or forage budget or whatever kind of, you know, if as long as you're going, well, I've got this much feed and I've done some equation, you know, or, you know, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a documented method of recording this, then that, that sort of fits into the intent of that particular question. That makes sense. Well, I've got you. Can I ask another question? Yeah, of course. Okay. And sorry to bore everyone, it's about the soil loss equation again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, can it become, uh, can you sort of like um, manipulate it so that because you've got cover, you know, you've got a cover layer, and if you've got zero cover, you've got a stall. And that means you're losing the topsoil, and then you start getting the effects of loss of subsoil, which is often much more erosive. Is there a factor or a can you manipulate the equation so that if you've got zero cover, uh, yeah, 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 no, I know. Using the topsoil, and you've got a much bigger problem into the thing, yeah, yeah. So I this can't, is, yeah, and sorry, in these areas, like the gully will be minute, but the school is much bigger. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there's there's some really good evidence around that those scalds are where the bulk of the sediment's coming from from the landscape. Yeah, um, you know, not really from the areas with with grass. Grass does such a good job of holding things together, even when it's not a huge amount. As soon as it's gone, it's it's kind of catastrophic. Um, the the thing is, is that it wasn't designed around scalds. So, and we've had this conversation I've had this conversation with Scott Wilkinson um, in the past about it because he's very much look it's it doesn't it doesn't fit in I'm not a universal soil loss equation expert um, Mark Silburn is a universal soil loss equation expert so he's he's he would have an answer for this you just got to try and get hold of him um, I my my opinion is that the universal soil loss equation, because it was never designed for that, it's it probably it will, it will definitely give you a number, but your confidence in that number is is what kind of thing. I don't think it's ever been tested on it. Not that I'm not that I've ever seen. Um, so yeah, it will give you a number. How sensible that number is, I really have no idea. I would be just cautious about doing it about using it because I, I just don't know how sensible that number is. <clears throat> All right, I'll open the floor up to anybody else who might have a last minute question before we wrap things up. Nope. And if, if anybody, um, you know, it should have my email address or if not, you know, you can get it from Rob or um, whoever kind of thing. So uh, feel free to flick us an email, and ask any other questions if you think about stuff later. So um, I don't know whether you'll put my email address in the link or something like that yeah. of this video or something. So yeah, my um, contacts are around. Yeah. Um, all right. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> um, if anything else comes in, we'll, you know, we're always happy to forward questions on and, and you know, publicize a, a response. Um, so thank you very much for that presentation. It's been very informative. Um, I'm happy that we've actually touched on a couple of questions that a few um, people have put forward and, and hopefully clarified some things. So moving forward in the series, um, we're proposing next month to run a session, um, hopefully get Carl back to help us um, do a deep dive and explain her into the Reef report card that was recently released. So that would be a, that would be an interesting session to sit in on um, for both cane and grazing. Um, and then further to that, moving forward, we've got um, a face-to-face -face event in June up in Charles Towers um, 
um, with um, hopefully a, or, or hopefully with a number of um, keynote speakers and local grazing presenters. So that'll be something to look forward to as well for anybody um, who's interested in that. Um, all of that information is available on our NQ Dry Tropics website. And as I said at the start of this session, we'll be um, posting a recording of this session and also a summary and a copy of your slides, Adam, um, as you presented them. Um, and those, that should all go live in the next day or two. So thanks again, Adam, for your time. I hope this format's working for you. I think it's really good that sort of means that a, we're able to um, run these without a lot of fuss, but B, we're able to record them. So they're available for anybody after the fact to still see. So there's a lot of benefits in that, I think. Um, we're also cutting down on carbon emissions, not flying you around the countryside all the time. So that's not a bad outcome either. Uh, yeah. I know you love to come to Townsville, but... <laughs> oh, I don't mind it. I'm going to lose my gold membership at the Qantas Club. I haven't flown hardly any. It's like... Oh, mate, we'll get, we'll get you up to Charles Towers for the face-to-face. -to -face. How's that? <laughs> Well, I was going to say, um, so Carl's, Carl's really quite crook, so um, yeah, we'll have to work around trying to find somebody to present Carl's place. So. Okay, well, we'll work with that. Uh, we'll work with the <laughs> Patrick Tarif team to work out who can help us with that one. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very, very much for your time, Adam, and thanks everyone for joining us for this session and look forward to seeing you at the next one next month. Yep, no worries. Here's thanks all. a lot, guys. We'll talk to you all. Bye.